As a result, circulation here at the Almanac plummeted. We went from selling several hundred thousand copies to 88,000 copies in 1938. Of course, it doesn't help that Mr. Scaife dropped the weather forecast from that issue and he ceased looking back on past ways. That has made him infamous in Almanac history. After Rob Sagendorf, founder of Yankee Magazine, moved to Dublin, New Hampshire and bought the Old Farmer's Almanac in 1939, he made changes toward progress. By referring back to Robert B. Thomas's old ways, the traditional sense had found its way back into the homes of millions of New Englanders. Rhyming forecasts were added to the calendar section. The hole that is now found in the top left-hand corner of the book was placed back into the almanac for convenience so readers could tie a string around it and hang it from a nail to read on their walls. Sagendorf's efforts helped launch the almanac from 1.5 million copies in 1963 to 3.5 million in 1983. However, it was during this time period when the almanac, for the first time, almost missed a year of publication. In 1942, they captured a spy, a German spy on Long Island, and um, presumably he was dropped off there by a U-boat, but they can't be certain. In any case, he had a copy of the Old Farmer's Almanac in his pocket, and the War Department wondered at that point if it was dangerous um, for the Old Farmer's Almanac to continue to publish its long-term weather forecasts, lest they be used against us. And so they came to Rob Sagendorf, the editor and publisher, and uh, said to him, you know, we really don't want you to publish these long-range weather forecasts anymore. And um, he was able to maneuver around it by calling them weather indications. And uh, in that way, the Old Farmer's Almanac kept its continuous record of publishing. After Sagendorf passed away in 1970, his nephew Judson Hale took over as editor. Well, people often ask me, uh, you know, how did I get to be the editor? Rob Sagendorf was my mother's brother. He purchased the Old Farmer's Almanac from Little Brown four years after starting Yankee Magazine in 1935. And I came in 1958 and nobody else would give me a job. I would go around saying I'd majored in English at Dartmouth and I could drive a tank. Nobody was impressed with either one. So I called my uncle Rob. I'd met him twice before. My mother and he didn't get along that well. And I can remember the phone call. I, sa I said, Uncle Rob, this is your, your nephew, Judd. And I emphasized the word uncle, by the way. And he said, yeah, yeah, John, how are you? No, Judd, I said. He called me John for the first three, four months here. <laughs> but we became very close. I worked with him for 12 years. When I first came, I thought I would be here for like six months. And it started out that kind of a, you know, just for experience. And then it became a job. And then it became a career. And then it became my life. And that's really the truth. Our theory behind the weather forecast hasn't changed much at all. But the way we predict them has gone high tech since around 1970. That year, Rob Sagendorf brought Dr. Richard Head on board. Dr. Head was a NASA solar physicist, and he would, in fact, predict the windows of opportunity for NASA to launch rockets into space based on sunspot activity, which, as you probably know, is one of the disciplines by which we make our forecasts. Dr. Head assumed the pseudonym of Abe Weatherwise, and he was our weather forecaster for 25 years. Dr. Head set up the weather regions as we know them today, the format of the presentation of the weather forecast, and adhered to the disciplines of solar science, climatology, and meteorology in making those forecasts. Only a select number of people have ever seen that formula through history. We can reveal the disciplines, of course, the solar science, the climatology, the fact that we use meteorology in making our forecasts, but that particular formula and the paper that it's written on is something that very few people ever get to see. You know, advertising was a part of the Old Farmer's Almanac even when it first came out. It was mostly school uh, supplies, textbooks, and so forth. It was after the Civil War that uh, patent medicines began coming in. And um, that, they lasted right up until, you know, now. Like, for instance, we had, uh, when I first came here 50-some years ago, we had rooster pills in there. Of course, Viagra's taken over that a little bit. But, um, and we have uh, store teeth, you know, store teeth? False teeth, that is. They were guaranteed. If you got them and you didn't like them, well, you could send them back and get your money back. Advertising has always been a part of the Almanac. It's a little bit hokey, some of it, but uh, fun. You know, the thrill that we all have working on this icon, this American icon, it's a legacy that we are just the caretakers of right now. 
and we will pass on to many generations to come. You have to have a sense of humor, you know, uh, to read the Old Farmer's Almanac, but also there's a lot of serious business there. I mean, it's a calendar of the heavens. The ancient Arabic language, the word almanac means that, a calendar of the heavens. We own the almanac, but I don't think of it that way. We're the custodians of the almanac. Uh, we're continuing a long and honorable publishing tradition. The secret to the success of the Old Farmer's Almanac, I've learned, is really not to change it. I read virtually every issue and I saw that Robert B. Thomas and all of his successors subscribed to his basic idea and that it was to be useful with a pleasant degree of humor. It is gratifying to have the pleasure once more of presenting our little work to our friends and patrons who have so long and so kindly encouraged and patronized the Farmer's Almanac.